All right, guys, welcome back to Hop on the Potty with Matt McInnes Watson. We are here for episode three. We've made it to <laughs> somewhat a uh, <laughs> a number of episodes. We had my solo one last week, which I hope you guys enjoyed, and Angus Bradley on episode one. But today we have Dr. Andy Chen with us, um, which I am really excited uh, for you guys to to dive into. Um, if you don't know or have not heard of Andy, um, well, I, I think he's a unbelievable businessman and and physical therapist to to go with that. He he might call himself a physical therapist first, or whether he called himself a businessman first. Um, yeah, I I really really respect Andy on many levels. So welcome in, and uh, it's great to have you on, Andy. Appreciate you, man. What what does the party mean? You know, what's, what's the... it's uh it's it's like a shortened word for podcast i had this the other day one, one guy was like why don't you just call it hop on the pod and i was like because i keep referring to a podcast as a potty i was like oh yeah i watched this i listened to this potty the other day <laughs> <laughs> i think i think that actually comes from from hearing angus bradley talk about it it's like an aussie kind of oh yeah he was on a potty and i was <laughs> so it was it's like <laughs> i've kind of maybe stolen that and i thought hop on the potty you know it's got a spin-off of words in in many ways so you know come on hop on my potty andy chen what have you got for me today <laughs> love it man how are things good man it's uh we just came off our first in-person seminar weekend and if anyone's ever thinking about, you know, talking from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. to 4 p.m. two days in a row, <laughs> highly recommend like getting a backpack with a water pouch attached to it so you can drink water throughout the day. <laughs> um, highly recommending your videographer reminds you to drink water throughout the day. <laughs> like yesterday, man, I put on Vaseline on my lip probably five times. My lips are so dry. <laughs> How would you feel when you came to uh, so? Well, I apologize for having you onto something where you've now got to talk for for an extended period of time. <laughs> if I'd have, if I'd have not, well, if we would have known this, that we would have uh, come into such such a such a state, come off the back of it. I didn't actually know that you were running a double day. I only thought that you actually ran Saturday. So I apologize off of the back of that because no, dude. when I've run my seminars, like I genuine, it kind of puts the like the fear of God into me to think about a double week, like a two day weekend <laughs> seminar, because off the back of the seminars that I've run f like face to face, I genuinely feel hung over the next day. Like I am <laughs> exhausted coming off of it. Like you get to the end of it and you're like, you've got no words to spit out. It's like, <laughs> like I'm done. You just out of, out of things to say and, and energy zapping. It just, dries you clean of energy it really does so like you say if you ain't hydrating <laughs> like it's a big thing oh <laughs> hydrate man oh gosh but honestly it's one of those things where there's so much energy like even coming off that weekend and even today i thought i'd be a little bit more tired but off at six ready to go 12 hour day i'm like let's just get back into the mix like i enjoy it so much this this guy is uh i, I actually had this as a question and we i, I kind of debrief Andy as we came on and I was like yeah I wanted to speak about his kind of motivations I think that he's just genuinely someone that wakes up ready to go most days and is moving between working with people face to face doing online education going to jujitsu back to back and run into Manhattan from where he lives or whatever like riding in I've seen you do a few things where you're like oh, I'm get like getting back into running or getting back into riding or whatever it is and I'm like and I wish I had like a third of that energy. Like I just don't have that get up and go. I'm like, and do you know what? It actually, it fits so similarly to how I was an, as an athlete. Like I'm such like a wave rider when it comes to energy. Like I can't just sustain long bouts at like 75% or it, it, like if I was to do your, your weekly load, it would be like 120% for me. But like I, I'm up and down very like one day if I've absolutely killed it with loads of work. The next day, I'm, I know I'm going to crash. I need to do monotonous admin stuff or just take my door and let my, my wife work or something like that. I don't know how you do it. No, for sure. And that's why I always say like Charlie Francis is like some of the best lifestyle coaching you can get. You know, that little high, low programming. You, you, if you know you're going to be sprinting, you got to be able to sprint. And if you know you need to be relaxing, like you got to be able to relax. Like I probably still see a full caseload, run an online mentorship with over 100 people on there launching three seminars 
trying to be a good significant other. Uh, we've got a physical therapy team that's growing two locations in the city. And it, it's a lot. And I find myself, you know, within these little moments, like whenever I see the sun, I close my eyes, tilt my head up to the, to the sky, and I just take a nice deep breath. And I just try to appreciate it for what it is. Right? It's like a nice reminder for me to slow it down. It's like when you fly from one place to another, think about the last time you were on a flight and just like think about where you are now. When you know that you're going to be spending time with family, like, you know, you with your daughter, it's probably just oh, everything could take a backseat. Like, let me just like be here, be present, you know? Yeah. And I, and also, I mean, I, I think about this all the time is, is actually being, I think trying to be present in all the different things that you do as well. I think one of the, one of my hardest, one of the hardest parts for me to get my head around is thinking about other things whilst I'm doing another task. And I think that exhausts me like tenfold rather than, do you know what I mean? If I, if I turn up to train, turn up to train, don't go on Instagram, don't, you know, answer a a message that you've got about programming or training or, you know, arranging calls with people like go there and train. Like the re- that can sit aside, and you can focus on focus on the task at hand. Um, but yeah, having I actually sometimes I think that having my daughter like has been like really hard on, on us to be able to obviously do the stuff for our business and you know whatever we want to achieve with that. But at the same time, it is that void to just go. Do you know what I need to take? I need to take the day with her and just go and remove myself from everything else and be present in that and which is yeah which is hugely unique and you didn't mention that you're a dog dad um so that is also a massive role as part of your day-to-day life right (laughs) no that's that's a big role and it's things like that where you know even when i got my dog in physical therapy school i would wake up 6 a.m try to train them for 30 minutes to an hour before i even go to school and those things really panned out because i could play dead he could roll over stand (laughs) on his legs like it's a little investment, but when you think about a schedule, right, especially if you're someone that's trying to get better at what you do, whether that's clinically or from a business standpoint, if your schedule is so packed that you have no room for growth, what happens when your business hits a wall? You have no time to figure out why. What happens when you have a client that walks through the door and you can't help? You have no time to read some new research, connect with other coaches find someone to consult with. So when you start to look at it from the grand scheme of things, you need time for yourself, whether you use it personally or from a professional standpoint, but you've got to bake days into your week where you're not doing anything so that you can let some good ideas come to you. Yeah. That's what I always find that when I am not working, some of the best stuff comes to me. Like when I, if I do a, a full day of working where I'm like in research, like digging into stuff, um, reading articles, listening to stuff. I always find it really hard to make social media content. If I'm just, yeah. I'm just moving around and I watch my daughter like move in a certain way, and I'm like, oh, that relates to that. And then, and then it's like this spiral of creativity that that comes up in me, and I'm, I'm far from creative, like so far beyond creative. It's ridiculous. I'm just. <laughs> you no, know, the biggest thing, right? It's like if you don't identify as someone that can be creative, you won't be creative. Like, you know, I always tell people there's no pressure to put any labels on anything. Like, you've got a brain. You've got a brain. These things are baked into who we are. Yeah. So it's like you have to be able to take a step back. But no, I agree. It's There's successful people in the world, and they do some certain things to make sure that their time is protected. Like, if you read about Bill Gates, Bill Gates goes to a cabin by himself with just books. It's crazy. He just reads. It's crazy. <laughs> I remember, I, I'm not sure if it was someone like Roald Dahl was the same. Um, when he wrote a lot of children's books, he would go into his like, it's like a shed in the garden. Just him, like, and obviously back when he was writing books, it was like literally just him, pen and paper, just sit and write, leave me alone, take enough like hot drinks to keep him fueled for a few hours. But yeah, it's like remove yourself from unfortunately and remove yourself from all distractions that are going on and uh, unfortunately you've got it in your pocket that's like the ultimate distraction uh, yeah it's tough but yeah um just on the topic of of what you do day to day like tell me tell me a little bit about um about your business moment um and and how that kind of moves and what your mentorship looks like because i think it it becomes really apparent to me that it's something that I look at and go, wow, like that is something that I dream plus pliers to, or for me to deliver one day is to have people 
jumping on something like a mentorship or a cohort that they can learn from in a, just so much more depth than, you know, taking bits from a course. It's great to take, to take, you know, small snippet courses and you can grab little bits of information from it. But when you're really getting into someone's head and really want to understand it, you know, getting conversation with them, you know, on a regular basis for you know three month extended period, it's just, there's just so much more value in it. So yeah, tell me, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, with Moment, the physical therapy practice, I kind of give you a little bit of a background. Um, with physical therapy, I, I was always working. I worked for someone else coming out of school, and it was a great job, but I was working just a lot of hours. And I was doing a little bit of everything, you know, I even hopped on some sales calls, built the website, online programming, built the online training program, youth FLA de- development, semi private training. This is on top of working with people one-on-one. So it got to the point where I was like, man, I'm putting a lot in. And it got to the point where I just had a little bit of a breakdown. I was just like, oh, this is not how I want to live my life. I spent a weekend in Austin with a bunch of entrepreneurs and people that are just go-getters. And I remember eating at this barbecue restaurant, Terry Black's in Austin, Texas. If you're ever in Austin, Texas, go get yourself some beef ribs. <laughs> But aside from that, <laughs> the worst place to have a panic attack is in a barbecue restaurant because you spend a hundred dollars on food and you're like not eating anything, which is that's just not the American way. Yeah. So that weekend, um, I looked at my fiance, Kristen, and I was like, I'm gonna make the jump. We're gonna start a physical therapy practice. And if you think about, you know, any important moment in your life, no pun intended, there's a, there's a turning point. Right? Something happens, and you're like, this is it, no more. Like, this is what we have to do. So we tossed the idea between like, hey, should we name ourselves moment or should we name ourselves turning point? And she was like, oh, we can't do turning point because that sounds like a dance company. She's got a dance background. Like, <laughs> you're right. I don't, you know, we don't really work with a lot of dancers. But I was like, hey, let's, let's do moment. Because moment originally started as a beer company. I was brewing beer during the pandemic. And I was like, hey, if I can make beer and I could create a beer for every single moment, then when you go to the grocery store, you don't have to think about what beer to get. Like if Matt goes to the grocery store and he sees a Snapdown is not a plyometric IPA, you know that's going to be a strong IPA. <laughs> that's going to be a very strong IPA. So that was, that was the goal originally. It was just having beers with a bunch of names that reflected your mood. And then we would think about moment. It was like, okay, there's been moments in my life where I felt like I had a moment of enlightenment where I'm like, wow, I didn't think this was possible, but now I do think it's possible. And when we work with the clients that come through our door, that's what we're thinking about, giving people moments where they've been in pain for 10, 15, 20 years, debilitating injuries, seeing every single provider under the sun, and now they get a moment of clarity that they can get better. So from when we started Moment, within three months, I filled up my own caseload and I filled up, filled up my fiance's caseload. And I was like, damn it, we're going to have to hire, but I just don't know who to hire. So I was like, let's, let's start a mentorship, right? Because now I think I've got some skin in the game. If we can fill up a caseload with three months without any paid ads, that's pretty solid. So I just put it on my story. I'm like, hey, we're going to be launching a mentorship. Not telling anyone that I was actually going to hire from it, but we're launching a mentorship. And I'm going to teach you everything I know about movement. This framework helped us build a business within three months. And I'm going to teach you everything I know. We launched the mentorship and we sold out in two days. And then I looked at Christy and Christy looked at me and I and look, and I said, Christy, now I've got to make a mentorship. <laughs> I didn't have anything yet. Yeah. Build it and they will come. Still, as they say. So, like, <laughs> oh, sell it, sell it, sell it and then build it or whatever, whatever way you got to look at. Yeah. It's the best way to no, for sure. And it, 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 we just we just did it. We just ran with it. I had an outline of what I knew we had to teach from a fundamental science perspective. You know, yeah. I didn't want to teach any tactics without under showing you why these tactics can work 80% of the time, which we call heuristics. And then the methods are just all the movements that can encapsulate what a human can do. And if you understand that, then I can teach you anything. So from there, we've just been building and building, but the people in the cohort. And cohort one didn't realize that week four was built in week three, right? I was just figuring it out as we go and troubleshooting as we go. And now we've gotten to the point where it's been, it's going to be our sixth cohort. We've sold out every single quarter 
and we're launching something, um, just more in-person experiences because, man, you know, teaching virtually is dope, but getting people in a room, feeling movement, and just getting all these little nuances of where you put, put pressure, how you're supposed to manage your center of mass, all those little things just make a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's if, – if I could do anything, it would be – it would be, you know, pushing people to come and see me teach live it is, yeah, it, it's worth 10 times what I think that you'll get from me presenting to you online. Um, and you, yeah, you just get a vibe. There's certain things that you can't even explain just how people, how, how their body language is when you present something to them. You're like, they didn't get that. <laughs> or, you know, getting them to understand what it feels like to, like for, for me, what it feels like to hit the ground. I had mm. so many people come away from the New York seminar, by the way, and oh, said yeah. to me, they, <laughs> well, they, number one, they said to me, we well, yeah, I'm a little bit sore today. Um, this was the day after, but I had a few people in the, in the week following up saying, I had no idea that that's how submaximal plyometrics were meant to be done. And I had no idea that you could make intense plyometrics as intense maybe as I was trying to make them when I was doing things like single leg hopping. But like it's, you know, and, and some of the people that they work with, they might never get to those sort of levels, but you have a spectrum of seeing, you know, where this stuff can go. And there are some people that you'll work with that will just be, you know, gifted enough or ready for those sort of things. So it's, yeah, it's just opening people's eyes up to that stuff. So, by the way, like hats off to you, like to to fill the mentorship like that and have a continued movement of uh, of one every quarter is is testament to to what you're doing. So, like I hugely respect it. Um, and I was lucky enough to to present to your guys on it. Um, and yeah, they're inquisitive people. Um, and I, yeah, I just felt that. It's, you know, and I've looked at, I've looked at your mentorship recently as well. At other people, I was like, oh, I wonder who else he's had on it. And you've had some, you've had some awesome people on there. So it's, uh, yeah, if you are in that field and you want to, you want to, you know, find out more about what Andy does and, and learn about some of his processes and, and how he sets his movement, then I suggest you get over to check that out because it's, yeah, it's an awesome space to, to learn in. Um, so yeah, so you've got, so you have that and you also have your, your training, you have a training app as well, right? Yeah, so this is where <laughs> things get a little, it gets a little fun, right? Like I'm always open to sharing everything yeah. and we don't have a training app anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, um, I've realized you can't do a lot of things, well, you know, and until you've built a team big enough to help you handle those things, focus on what you're doing well, because the quality of what, how you do one thing is going to reflect or it's going to help people make inferences on the other things. Yes. So if I can't dedicate my time and all of my effort into something like a training app, I don't want to half-ass it. So we were doing enough, but it's just like, it was in the back burner for me. I scrapped it. We still produce some programs that we sell, but for me, I just wanted people, I was trying to fill a gap that I wasn't prepared to fill yet. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking about going into business, don't try to do too many things. Like, oh man, running a practice is already a lot. Running an educational thing on top of a practice and then still trying to have a life out of it. Oh, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a huge, you know what? Certain things are like, there's like a, there's like huge respect to being like, do you know what? We can't do that right now. We cannot yeah. do that. Like that. That takes more. I, I think that's one of my, one of my worst traits is trying to spin too many plates at once um, and not there's a lot about like, oh, you can be the generalist and you can, you know, great. You can be generalist in, in many different things, but you got to be specific and you got to hit, hit those, those right markers, um, with what you're trying to achieve rather than it all being kind of sub-maximal and kind of not to the essence that you want to really deliver it to. Um, and it's actually genuinely exactly what we, the, the kind of direction that we're taking right now is we are, we are launching our um subscription programs into an app um actually off the back of what we spoke about i mean but you know that's our that's our number one offering in terms of in terms of training and programming anyway you know i did do deliver some educational stuff but i'm not running a practice <laughs> i'm not <laughs> i don't have quite that many things to spin but yeah it's um that's kind hey, of <laughs> you have a, you have a daughter 
<laughs> true, true, true. Give yourself some credit. Yeah. She turned one today. She oh, man, I saw the picture. So freaking cute. She turned one today. I cannot believe it. Cannot cannot believe it my wife had a meltdown last night oh hopefully she doesn't hear this bit of the podcast <laughs> oh my she gosh. she uh yeah i bought her something for christmas it's like 21 years every year she writes her like a letter then we're gonna give it to her when she's 21 um right right the first one yesterday first birthday <laughs> meltdown that was oh, like, it's gosh. like all comes flooding back to you like oh my every year's gonna be this fast maybe quicker like it's yeah crazy Crazy. So I, I just don't want to read the letters from 14 to 18. It's going to be some curse words. It's going to be, you got to get it together. <laughs> I told you you should have been studying for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, but yeah, yeah. We, we're really trying to focus in on, on like one or two things now. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a big respect to, yeah, just, just saying, you know what, we're backing off of that. We don't need to do that. We are going to be the best in this space. Um, and I think that, do you see it a lot more? Do you see a lot of a lot more people shifting in? Like I'm gonna be that guy right now. I see it a lot online right now. You've got like someone. Oh, is, someone's gonna take you from here to here, guaranteed. Bang. It's I, it's almost like so hyper focused now that sometimes I look at certain people's IG bios and I'm like, <laughs> I wonder if you actually work with people. Because it's like, oh, I help people in their 30s and 40s that live in Manhattan, New York, that play volleyball maybe twice a week, get back to living pain free and performing at a high level. It's like, whoa, like, great niche, dude. Yeah, <laughs> great there's, niche, but there's seven of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you got to you gotta realize it's like you can demonstrate your expertise without putting it into your bio, right? Like, yeah. Most of my followers know that I do jujitsu just by me sharing it on my story. You know, most of my followers know that I love drinking wine and beer because I share a glass of wine you know, once a week or I got a puggle. And those are the things where you don't have to identify who you are. Like, don't be the guy for this very one specific thing. Just kind of create a more of a broader subgroup that people can resonate with, yeah. you know, certain traits that they resonate with. And then start to show your expertise within your content, your story and who you are that's where you get all the money definitely definitely and i think as well that you know allow i do think that allowing your expertise to open the door is far like i, I think that's a really great thing i think i heard vernon griffiths talk about this when he said like you know i'm known maybe as this guy but open pandora's box and you, like this is also what i'm I, you know i've got a lot to give in many other different directions as well so um but I do think that you've got to open that box every so often because it just dries. Like even myself, like I start to do, like I start to question. Like people must be sick of this stuff, surely. <laughs> like I'm just jumping yeah. around on the screen. There's only so much that you can dig into. So that's why I kind of have to find myself going in different directions with, you know, looking at different sports or looking at different ways in which it bleeds into slower stuff or faster stuff. And it is tough. Like physical therapy is, it's it's as wide as you want to make it, right? It can it can go down to pain. It can go down to biomechanical movement. It can go down to biological physiological processes. It, you know, it goes so deep. Um, so yeah, it's 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 tough. And I think, like, just speaking to a few people recently that are trying to start now, I'm like, it must be really tough to try and find a voice on social media platforms right now. Um, and like you say, like maybe if 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 you are trying to do that now. How, how do you go about doing it? You can make yourself the guy of something, but, you know, show a little bit of other, other stuff because. No, you, you, I think alluded to a great point. It's like, sometimes you do have to narrow down a little bit, but are you putting yourself in the right position to narrow down on something? You know, like if, is there a lot of people out there that are doing that specific thing? Like you're narrowing it down to plyos. There is way too many people. They need to learn how to prescribe, coach, and do plyos, you know. But if you're looking to work with like you know marine biologists that do kettlebells, it's like okay, this is kind of tough. But if you start to figure out where your where your scope is, where you already have a community, because ideally when you start social media, you haven't been in the basement, you know, the whole your whole life, and you've been out in the world, you've been meeting people, and you naturally gravitate towards certain people, and certain people naturally gravitate towards you, 
those are your people. And then that's when you can start to find your voice. Hmm. Who are your people? If you were to, if you were to, the, okay, you can't say physical therapists. Who are your people? <laughs> like, who do you find yourself? So like uh, when, when we did our seminar, who did you, obviously you've got friends and stuff, but who would you gravitate more towards? Would you find yourself in and amongst like SNC coaches more or PTs or personal trainers or, you know, where, where do you, where do you find yourself gravitating more towards or people with nice trainers? <laughs> Cause I know you're, um, I know you're a sneaker head, man. <laughs> yeah. The people with the nice kicks always like, you know, you look at each other, two second pause, you nod your head and you look away. <laughs> you, res- like, you, re- man. you respect that they've spent, you know, half a month's wage on, on those. <laughs> you like, give you know, up. now, now I can even spend a couple of years wage because you know, they get these payment plans from Jordan sometimes to like, say, Oh, you want to break this payment up? You've got to break up your payments for sneakers. Don't buy those sneakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're above, they're above what you should be paying. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think the, the people that I naturally gravitate towards and people that I'm sure you as well, because like me and you got along pretty well. And I knew that we would because we've talked before meeting in person. But it's the people that really appreciate your time and other people's time, you know. I don't want someone to just talk to me and only be about me. Like everyone in that New York City group, you know, it wasn't just, okay, I got to wait to talk to Matt. Everyone's talking to each other and everyone's, a, you know, valuing each other's time. So it's not just like one kind of person in regards to like their profession. It's just more so like the mannerisms. Like it, it gets so crazy this day and age where people feel like they're the only person in this world. And I'm like, everyone matters. Like, I'm not that important. You know, like you're smart. I'm smart. We've all got different ways of looking at stuff. So the more open-minded you are, the more I'm naturally going to gravitate towards you. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And I think that that's also becoming apparent towards, I know, you know, you could say, oh, I'd like to mentor, educate the people that you gravitate to as well. But you kind of do want that in an essence because like people that came to the seminar in New York, like I would say it quite often that, you know, you're the expert in your field. I'm here to give you the tools to be able to go away and create something that fits in your field. So you can't come to me and say, here's my hand, kind of give me the answer. You know, it's not like a a take. It's not like a I pay for something and I get exactly what I need perfectly in that given moment, right? You know, you're not purchasing a pair of sneakers. You're you're purchasing something that's potentially going to give you. It's going to open parts of your your mind up to looking at things in different ways. It's so different. Um, I think when you do have someone that I get a lot of people online that ask me like snap questions, give me this answer. What do I need? <laughs> what do I need to jump high? And I'm like, I don't know. Who knows? I don't know you for starters. So who knows what, what you need? There's a thousand ways in which you could jump higher, um, lose five kilos. There you go. You probably jump higher. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost like I've, I have thought about that before, you know, could you have like your kind of people be, and maybe that just naturally happens anyway, but sometimes you get people, like you say, we, we mentioned that before we, um, we went out, sorry, we went out. I was taken out by Andy um, and his, his <laughs> fiance. We, 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 we towed Matt, we had Maddie in tow. We had her in a bar at like half 10 at night in Brooklyn, which was just awesome. Like that's just how we parent. We, you know, she was asleep, happy as Larry. And we, we went out for great pizza, went out for a few drinks and stuff. And uh, Andy was like, I knew that we were going to get on. It's just chill. Like we knew exactly the sort of conversation we were going to have. It was going to be relaxed with, with the same kind of people, but sometimes you meet someone and it's not as easy as you think it's going to be. <laughs> and you're like, oh, you're not, yeah. you're not how I assumed you were going to be. Um, so it's always a nice feeling when you do get someone like that and you're like, oh, it's kind of relieving. You can just chill and be relaxed. And by the way, I, I have to say, like, thank you so much for what you did for, for myself in, in New York and the, the seminar, you know, pushing people towards it and saying, you know, you got to go and see this guy. Because I know that there's a lot of people that, you know, came through you to come to the seminar. Um, and off the back of it, we've, I've built some, started to build some really good relationships with other people. Um, so, th- you know, that means a lot um, for you to do that. Um. <laughs> you, you remember, man, when we were going through the demos, we had some people that were flying. Like we had some good jumpers. We, I, I, you know, I, I said this to the boys that we did one in London the week before I was like, People in people in London, unfortunately, just didn't compare to how some of the guys, some of the guys <laughs> were popping off. I don't know what they're eating. I don't know where they come from, but they were. No, they 
yeah, we had some, they just looked like track athletes. That's, that's exactly, I was like, this guy, this guy does track. Well, I, I know, I now know that, I know that Derek, he, he was a hurdler and stuff, <laughs> but there was a couple of other guys and I was just like, oh, I have, I'd not like interacted with them necessarily and like, or like seen them move online. I'd seen Derek move cause he, he's a, in the, in the program and stuff. Um, but yeah, I was well impressed, like seriously impressed. And you can move pretty well yourself. You're, you know, you could be a little bit stiff sometimes. I think that might be from your lifting background, but <laughs> you can still pop it. You can, I was, I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised in, in terms of, you know, you got, got a bit of elasticity in there. You can, you can bounce when you need to. I can only do it for about three reps when I demo the exercise for my patients. And that's it. I lose it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's the, the background is different. And right? like I come from bodybuilding into powerlifting into yeah. kettlebells and like sprinting for a little bit. Then I've gone into a little bit more just like general running jujitsu and stuff. So it's evolved a lot for a long period of time. It always looked like I was doing a sumo deadlift, whatever I was doing. <laughs> and it was just tough. <laughs> You know, I, I, you know, I, I know a lot more people that do jujitsu now, obviously, because it's exploded in the last like decade. It's one sport that I just people ask me like, "Will jujitsu, will plyometrics help with jujitsu?" And I'm like, "Probably not." <laughs> like, you spend like you spend like ninety nine percent of the time on the floor. It, you know, <laughs> it's probably not going to transfer. So doing jujitsu and then right, I will say, go on. No, no, deep tears. Yeah, will help you get ready. Okay. For some deep positions than jiu-jitsu. Okay. Okay. See, good, like, you know, stuff to learn. This is, this is, and this is the stuff that I learned from the seminars. I turn up and I've got someone that is in powerlifting, that's in jujitsu, that's in, we had MMA guy that came with his flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see these, my guy. Yes. Oh, man. Turned up with a flip phone. Me and Andy were like, you just got a flip phone. He's like, yep. That's all I'm rocking now. Got rid of it. You know, saw saw myself using my iPhone whilst my kids trying to get my attention. That was it. Game over. That was enough. Like, wow, that's that's commitment. That's commitment. Fair play to him. No, but these things are. It's. Uh, I think it's crucial. Yeah. Right. Like we just are always on the phone. Yeah. Um, little things like even Alex Ramosi posted the other day. It's like if you make your phone grayscale, you use it way less. And I was like, wow, I had no idea, and I could see why. If your phone looks like a Kindle, it doesn't feel as attractive. It's like it's yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah. And I'm probably gonna do that soon. Yeah. All right, cool. Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do it for March. Let's see. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna set a challenge for the whole of March. Let's see how much our screen time goes down. And I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna call you back on this. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Harvey, our our producer, to snip this bit out and we'll put it back up in March. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call you up on that and be like, let me <laughs> see how much your screen time dropped. It's actually do you ever look at your screen time? It's embarrassing. Absolutely embarrassing. Oh. Like I can't. I'm, I'm five hours a day. Same. I once I get to six, like I get to six, I'm in rush shape. My eyes hurt. I'm a little cranky. I try to keep it at four to five a day. Four to five hours a day. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> imagine if you read for four to five hours a day. I, the worst part about it is like, is how quickly you can get in and out of it, right? You can't open a book on a page and just start reading and indulge yourself into it, right? Everything that you flick between has like a, has like a start and ending in that like 30 seconds. And it's, maybe that's, yeah. Maybe people need to create books that are more like that. <laughs> just, <laughs> well, that's cool. No, but you, you probably feel that way when you're coming into Europe, right? It's just like billboard, ass, another copy, another thing, noise, logos on cars. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. All right. Um, I was going to ask you. Um, I was going to ask you a little bit around your motivations and stuff, um, and what you're passionate. Like, what what is your passion day to day with physical therapy? Is it does it relate directly? Kind of what to you? What you were saying towards um, starting moment and you know, and giving people that moment of clarity. Yeah, it's very very similar. Um, I've, I've dealt with like anxiety, depression throughout my life. And there's been moments in time where it's like, you're down in a ditch and like, oh man, is this rock bottom? And like, this has to be in the next week. It's like, nope, you can get lower. And you get to the point where you feel like you don't have any answers. 
right? You feel like there's something inherently wrong with you and it sucks, right? To feel like you're broken, to feel like something needs to be fixed and until it's fixed, nothing's going to change. And when you have that kind of mindset about your body, there's nothing else that you can do, right? From a mental perspective, from a social perspective, it doesn't matter if I start to go hang out with other people. I'm broken. Me, myself, I'm broken. So it's not until you start to read other books and you start to educate yourself and you start to realize that what you're experiencing is a part of being human. And I get to normalize my sensations because what happens with pain, especially if you've been in pain for a long time, is you start to pathologize everything. Like it's good that your body is in pain to a degree, but because it's going to warn you when something's wrong and when something needs to change. But when you've been in pain for a long period of time, sometimes it's not always a very accurate depiction of how you're feeling or how you're doing. And when you're depressed for a long, long period of time, or you're very, very anxious for a long period of time, you get into a very similar rut. So you read, well, I read uh, my neuro professor in physical therapy school. He was like, hey, everyone should read this book. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. And it just talks about neuroplasticity and how things can change. And just learning that the brain can change based on the input made me rethink everything before. Then I read books like Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. And I'm like, oh, this is how stress relates to everything else. And then I start going down the rabbit hole. You read some of the seem to leave anti-fragile. I'm like, okay. Stress is good for me. If I can get acclimated to the stress, I'd be more anti-fragile. And you keep reading, you keep learning, you keep having these moments, and you're like, I'm capable. I might not feel great every single day, but I'm capable, and I can do something and grab, slowly get myself towards where I want to be. So my motivation for the day is like every single patient that we see, they just need a couple of aha moments, right? They need me to give them a couple of aha moments, whether that's me giving the appropriate questions so they can answer these things and come up with the answer themselves, whether it's me giving them a resource where I'm like, hey, you really need to read this book or this article. I think it's going to help you tremendously. Whether it's me just showing them right, that we could change the little bit of movement that they're doing already, change the foot pressure, change the shin angle, giving you a weight, putting you on a heel ramp, putting any kind of variation to get you to train comfortably and then scale those things up using physics and biomechanics, right? Increasing the impulse, increasing the velocity, increasing the displacement, all those little things. And now you keep progressing the exercise until one week they look at you and they're like, hey, I'm doing my sport again. I'm like, that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to progress everything until you can do what you want to do. So powerful. So powerful. It must be, it, it's almost like a, it's almost like an easy motivation to have. People struggle to, they struggle to get to something that motivates them, I think. But having that is, I th obviously your experience feeds so heavily into that anyway. So I think it's, it like marries itself up really nicely in that you understand what that person's going through more. I would say that, like I I wouldn't necessarily say that I've ever kind of been through um, any issues really like mental health. You know, we all have our, all, all have had our moments in terms of when we're like highly stressed and just, you know, just bury our head, not know really what to do with our headspace and stuff. But um, I, I think that I've been okay in that side of things and I haven't had that many major injuries. Um, but my, I do think that I had a really big struggle leaving behind being an athlete um and, and i had a hangover i literally i reckon i had about maybe a four or five year hangover of and it's why why i found trying to get back in shape and get back into training a really difficult thing for myself like i see people that are like still chasing like you know getting in the best shape of their life at, at my age when they've been an athlete and i i just couldn't get around that so um yeah my motivation to find, you know, my passion in that again is really tough. So for you to have that, like, it's, that's awesome for you to, you know, that drives what you're doing in your, you know, in your passion, but also in your business, like nothing, nothing beats that. Um, so, you know, when, when, when your passion lies in that sort of stuff, um, that's really powerful. So that's cool. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, because I think a lot of people can take from that as well. Um, and actually, even if they are just in pain or that, you know, they're suffering in that sense, 
that there is ways around it that's not necessarily doesn't have to be through physical therapy it could be just through having clarity moments like reading a book and going oh shit this that there is an end to this tunnel we don't have to be in pain all the time or whatever um yeah it's crazy it's crazy like i, I speak to my wife about this we know we know a few people that you know they're just like oh i can't do that because i've got my because my knees are done my knees are finished I'm like what do you mean your knees are finished like oh i've just got bad knees so i can't ever do that do you mean you've got bad knees no you have a condition there's there's a reason for that you have got tendonitis tendinopathy you've got you know whatever it could be a whole host of different things but your knees aren't done you're 30. <laughs> you're <Yeah. laughs> It, it used to be like, you know, people would see you in their 50s or 60s, like, oh, I've got bad knees. Now you got people in their 20s, like, I've got bad knees. I'm like, my brother in Christ, you just graduated with an undergrad degree. You don't have bad knees. <laughs> yeah. You just, we can still, yeah. yeah, we can still get you right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. We, I think people are getting better, but we still have this defeatist mentality of that, like, oh, like you say, you've got, this is it. I'm done now. My, my, my athletic career is done. So that means my, the whole of my like exercising life is finished. And you're like, what? Like you, you've probably done what you should have done. Maybe 10% of the amount of exercise that you will do for the rest of your life in when you're m maybe in the best peak, uh, peak physical performance, maybe between your twenties and thirties. Right. But between 30 and 60, you should be doing, you know, 80, 90% of, you know, what, the total amount of exercise that you'll do forever. So you better be in, in shape to do that and not assuming that you're done at 30. <laughs> it's crazy. Absolutely yeah, it's, crazy. You're going to realize it's like, as you start to work with people, you know, one of, one of the therapists in a seminar was like, how do you know someone, like, how do you know where to start with a client? I'm like, if a client is walking towards you and you know, that really having an abnormal, painful gait, they can do plyometrics. <laughs> they can start to do some level of plyometrics. Yeah. And if your client can walk up and down the stairs, they could probably do single leg plyometrics to a very low, low degree, right? Yes. So it's one of these things where if you can sit on a toilet, you can squat. If you can pick something off the floor, you can deadlift. There's something that you can do right now that can be scaled to a higher level activity. And the beautiful thing about being human is that a lot of our systems are very predictable. You stress the system too little, you're going to get weaker. You stress the system too much, you're going to get injured. You stress the system just enough over time and you're going to build resilience. Yeah. Can we just go back to that? Um, that little bit about plyometrics. Um, <laughs> you want to... <laughs> you spark. Oh, man. You, you spark. People get... Yeah. Oh, no, no. You... No, I was just going to say, you, you, sparked, you sparked that in my head straight away. I'm like, ooh, yes, we, we, need to, we need to circle back on that for sure. Like. Go on, tell me, tell me what you were going to say, like in terms of what people assume with pliers or dynamic movement. I think people don't think that they can start plyometrics early enough because they don't understand their plyometric framework. Maybe they only know what a, you know, it's a box jump, which is in a plyo, Matt, don't worry. You're on it for a reason. Um, but they don't have an actual plyometric framework, right? They just have a couple of exercises that people have seen or do, or maybe they learn, but they don't have a way to scale it for something so small. If you think about what falling, I mean, if you think about what walking is, damn it, walking is just controlled falling. Whenever you're walking, you're decelerating and reaccelerating. If you're constantly accelerating, you're going to look like you're falling forward. So you're already managing some of the forces that you would in plyometrics to a degree. And now you just have to create some of that cyclical effect. And it could be very low amplitude in the beginning. If you're walking up and down the stairs, you're really doing some single leg stuff. And now if you walk up and down the stairs really quickly, you can definitely do some plyos. Like there's so many people that wait until months and months of doing snap downs before the, you know, the landing looks perfect before we start to do plyos. And I'm like, you know, you walking up and sat down the stairs really quickly is probably, probably putting more load to your legs than a snap. That that's that's what I always I always come back to, and I think I had that question actually in New York. Someone said to me like, "How do you? How would you start someone or someone that's maybe older generation? Like, what could you do to get them into some more dynamic stuff?" I'm like, "Well, those movements that you want to get to, start with a lower amplitude. You don't even have to leave the ground. You can just be pulsing the floor." What does that feel like? Well, if you collapse, all right, probably maybe need to take a step back, 
right? If someone drops into that, just a pulse in and out of that kind of sensation of how a landing would feel and they crumble. All right, cool. You've, you've, you've taken it to the brink, figure out something else, figure out that, you know, there might be eccentric strength problems, but if they, like you say, if they walk down the stairs into your practice or they live in a house and they're walking up and down stairs, fine, or they move over to you, fine. You have people that have clients run, but don't do any form of plyometrics. <laughs> but what does it, what, what does it do? It comes all back to what we assume plyometrics are. Number one, we assume that it is, especially in the, in the physical therapy world, if you can't triple hop, you, you know, you're not out of ACL rehab. Like that's like the first thing, right? It's like, let me measure your asymmetry right to left to triple, triple hop. I'm like, cool. And so, and so how do you get there? They assume that that's like the golden movement for plyometrics. I'm like, cool. Well, you know, there's value in it. Great. Cool. I see it. I see there's value in it, but there are a thousand different movements that you can do before you get to that. And they can be in the smallest amplitude. They don't have to be called plyometrics. They don't have to be in the perfect realms of the time frames or the, even like I said before, you don't even have to be landing and taking off. You're just getting that impulse sensation and eccentric, concentric, in and out kind of motion. Like you said, if you see it in other walks of life that they go through, they're probably going to be able to take it into what you're going to do with them because it's in an even, it's in a clinical setting, especially if you're a physical therapist, <laughs> right? You are controlling that environment to the absolute nth degree. If you want them to hold on to something and do it, start like that. If you're that fearful of it, but if they've walked over to you, to you that you've got a table in the little corner, they're probably pretty good for it. I, I love oh it. man. <laughs> Let's go back to the triple hop because there's certain things where <laughs> people are like, oh, do you not do it? I'm like, I do do it, but you just have to understand the quality and what you're looking for. You know, if it's the unaffected side and you see someone do a triple hop and each hop doesn't slow down and you stick that third one, they can probably decelerate really well. Then on the affected side, you see them hop, hop, and they purposely slow down, go up a little bit higher, spend some more time on the ground. And then they decelerate. It's not the same thing side to side, just because the distance is covered the same way. Or you have to look at the shapes you're getting. Where's someone? Do, uh, where's someone's bending their ankles, their knees, their hips, or maybe they don't bend at all, which you see way too often on the internet. These high-level plyometrics where the knee is stiff, and then the back's extended. You know, look at how quickly they come off the ground into the. You know, can they enter and come off smooth? Does the sound sound similar side to side? People are going, oh, they pop, same distance, we're good to go. And then yeah, measure and take. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. That the problem is is that it's so much harder for people to learn and for people to teach. So why not just give you an objective measure and say, you know what, if they, they do 10 meters on each side and it's, you know, there's a five percent a five percent discrepancy for a symmetry, you're you're winning. Let them go. They're ready to go. When when that discrepancy looks like absolute shit, you know, <laughs> and do you know what as well? What's crazy is that I remember having this conversation because I, I had one pretty, well, I'd say it's, it was a large injury. It kept me out for most of the season. And that's the biggest injury I ever had. And I rolled my ankle stepping off the back of a high jump bed and I put my foot in a hole that was hidden. I tried to sue them. It didn't work. But anyway, they, they basically, they put rubber matting around the edge of a high jump bed because it's normal. The high jump beds normally sat on top of concrete and the concrete had like a, a lip that met the grass. And there was a big hole, put my foot in it, rolled my ankle, big ankle sprain. So I got back into rehab. Physiotherapist was helping me out and, and nothing against the physiotherapist, but we, there was a couple of students that were helping out as well. Cause he, he was great at what he did, but he said to me, um, he said to me, what do you expect in terms of like, we've done the triple hop test and your left side is a lot better than your right side. And I said, well, yeah, I'm a left foot high jumper. I expect it to be like 10% better. He was like, yeah, but we need that for you to return. I'm like, yeah, but you got to understand that my right leg's <laughs> never going to be what my left leg is as well. So, and so straight away, like you, can you unpick that sort of stuff? Like that's like basic stuff. So if you've got someone that doesn't have, or maybe it's not confident enough to come to you and say, well, I'm a high jumper. That's my takeoff leg. Or like, I've, I'm a footballer right, or a soccer player and you kick with your right leg, your strong leg is going to be your left leg because it's your plant leg. It's going to be able to deal with a lot more eccentric load. 
So if you're landing really nicely on that, you're decelerating that third hop and catching it really well, but you can't do it on your right leg as well as, as effectively. Well, it's because that's how you play football. You do not. <laughs> and ultimately you might not ever need it for it to be as good as the other side. And, and unfortunately, you know, the, it must be tough for physical therapists to figure out, but I guess you've got to make a call on everything that, you know, it has to be personal to every individual that you, that you meet, but you've got to understand a symmetry in sport. I remember hearing Dan Pfaff talk about this. He's like, if you had a discus thrower, learn to throw the other side and the other way, you will mess up their dominant side. You will mess up the brain connections. It will, it will really confuse your neurological system and how it actually has to brace, throw, you know, and control everything. And I think that is, is apparent across every single sport. Um, so it's, there's so much to it that the arbitrary side is really shit and actually going, um, speaking to you about rhythm and stuff and being patient with that process and that side of things and, and looking at how you work in and out of a movement, the smoothness, the synchronicity of, of movement, I think has a bigger place for that. Let's say that actually what might be more valuable is going back to my reactive strength ratio that I came out with. Can you get within as close to a ratio of one as possible? It might be that your goal is to do that, right? If you've got an ACL injury, your eccentric ability might not be that great, but you know, you've trained a little bit in the gym and your concentric ability is better. So you might have a discrepancy in that, that ratio might be a little bit higher than one. So you're like, okay, it's a bit more of a concentric push, push kind of action that you're getting out of it. Well, for you to rein it back in, you might not have the same numbers in terms of distance for a triple hop, but your, your rhythm and ratio is, <laughs> is getting closer to that number. Maybe that's a way for people to go is to look at it and, synchronizing that i don't know what your thoughts are around that no i think having something like that is better than having nothing yeah. right there's certain things that just aren't going to be validated by the research because it hasn't been done yet you know if you set up a joint position in a very specific way and you test the muscle on each side and you're keeping it consistent side to side well you've just created your own test and if there's a discrepancy that's big enough and it's relevant to the person's shape right or the sport or what they're going to see in their sport then you don't need research. You just need to know the fundamental sciences. I can't confidently say that this is going to reduce injury or this is going to prevent injury, but I can probably feel very confident saying that if we bridge this gap, you're going to feel better, right? Your functional capabilities will improve. Yeah. So you don't have to wait for a systematic review to come out for these things. You know that you can get certain movements to feel better, look better, and you and they're starting to tolerate more force because of that. It's like, okay. We've increased your, your ceiling and that's all you're looking for. Yeah. And, and just the last thing to finish on that. I remember seeing someone do a triple hop that had an ankle injury and they scored near on the same both sides. And I heard them say half an hour later, like after the test, oh yeah, but that injured side is really hurting me now. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like the physio is like, he's like, great. We've hit that marker. Fantastic. Like maybe it's like a, another couple week process and then we'll get you back into doing what you were doing before. But if that kid's not told you that his ankle's now hurting again or what, like he's <laughs> with three, just three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like that. It's, it's, yeah. There's so many layers to it. Right. And like you say, some of the best parts of you as a, as a therapist, coach, trainer, is actually your interpersonal relationship with that individual. If they if they are telling you that sensationally they are feeling better, what does force tell you? Like, all right, great. If we continually make you feel better and you gradually get faster and more powerful over time, I, I don't know who, we're, who we are to argue it. But if you still feel like shit and maybe we're improving it a bit, is that good? I don't know. Maybe those are the sort of things to question, right? <laughs> Yeah, there's certain things, and if you look at it from like a biomotor perspective, like if you're improving all your biomotor qualities and you're bridging the gap to the unaffected side, and that's a conversation for another day, but if you're injured, you're probably not doing as much physical activity as you normally do. So the unaffected side sometimes isn't even a good measure of where you got to be. You just have to consider like, hey, what's the biomotor qualities of this sport? Does this person handle enough of those demands? And can they safely return to practice? Like, I'm a physical therapist. I'm not a sprint coach, but I can get you back sprinting. And if you've never worked with a high-level sprint coach, I could probably get you faster. 
But if you're running a sub 10 and you're going to come to me and ask me to get you faster, I can't do that. <laughs> but I can help you with all the other biomorphic qualities that can improve your ability to sprint or stay healthy enough to sprint. And that's kind of what you have to do with the process is like reverse engineer the demands. You don't need a systematic review and all of these studies to show you that. It's just, hey, let me increase this person's ceiling so that they can handle their sport better. Yeah. Love it. Love it. All right. So just a, a final thing to finish with. Um, I asked Angus Bradley this, but I said, what's, what's shaken you up recently? What's kind of made you, what's a crazy insight or moment? It could be literally anything. It could be related to absolutely anything. Um, anything, anything in the realms that you've been like, Ooh, okay. That's made me think about something a bit differently or just like, holy shit. Did you see that on <laughs> online or? Oh man, we gotta stick with one thing. We're gonna go like you know maybe two or three things. <laughs> go for it. Roll with it. We, it that's what this podcast is about. It's about it's freedom. Go with what you want to tell me. Oh man, first thing I would say is like business coaches without a business. Oh, <laughs> that is the biggest scandal in the world. Like if you're if this business coach is trying to sell you their business consulting services, and you look at their profile and you have no idea how to work with them on their actual business, right? Not them coaching you as a business. Let's say you, you got a business coach that's also a trainer and they don't have any history of exiting a company or owning a company and you have no idea how you can work with them to train. Their only business is coaching you. <laughs> and that's the blind leading the blind. So if you're going to work with someone, just make sure like, hey, does this person have like systems in place? Can I contact their staff? Can I contact their trainers and work with them? If you can't, they probably don't have a business and they're making money off of you. Other thing is we've fallen, we've, we've gone to two different sides, right? We've gone from like perfect landing, snap downs, everything's having perfect to, oh, it doesn't matter at all. This leg is just going to be stiff as hell. <laughs> and gonna, like things need to bend right from a, from a physics standpoint, like if everything is stiff and you just drop something off the rooftop, oh, it's going to shatter. Yeah, it's going to shatter. You're going to have more bone-related injuries. If something bends a lot and you get more excursion, you're probably going to have more muscle-related injuries. So you got people that are just like doing high-level level, level plows and it's just a stiff leg. And I watch this on Instagram. I'm like, please, dude, I, I don't I, do that. I wonder if people are going to start getting whiplash from that shit. Like they're like, <laughs> you know they jump with their they ju they're, they're leading with their head sometimes it's like yeah it's like boom. there's no push up the play yeah and then you have the other side where it's like you got people you know heavier people doing plyos and i'm like this poor person's gonna have a muscle strain injury <laughs> <laughs> yeah because they're spending too much time on the ground you all these forces their muscles must feel so sore and and if the intent is to come off the ground quick and they're not doing it you gotta change the intensity so the, the main thing, honestly, is just the fact that, like, I think people are just navigating the world without an actual framework. They're recreating the scenario in their head of how to work with people with every single athlete. You should know immediately within a few sessions whether or not you can help somebody if you have a framework. And there's too many people out there without a framework. If a, if a 120 kg or 300 pound guy walks in your door and you expect him to be stiff as anything on the ground, you're probably being a you know you, you really haven't ventured into the world enough to understand like what you're maybe going to get back off of this individual and you're like you know you just need to be stiffer come on 100 percent, like push it but no, it's not gonna work you, you have like you say you have to have a framework in place you have to have something that's going to start at a certain point and enable you to scale it up over time um but yeah no those are <laughs> the, the first and we we'll got we we'll got two more things where we have off it's Oh man, I talked about this in the uh, the seminar weekend, but there's something like there's millions of books produced every single year, and there's a shit ton of information out there, and we're not going to be able to read all of those in our lifetime. But how you start to figure out what to read is understand fundamentally fundament what's fundamentally true. Read fundamental science. Because 95% of the stuff out there doesn't even respect fundamental science. So that's how you start to figure out, okay, I can't listen to this person anymore. Because they don't understand what the hell they're talking about. It doesn't respect the rules and the laws that govern our world. And the other thing that I really like that Charlie Munger says 
is the realities of one field have to respect the realities of another field. You have to be able to be consistent across multiple fields, right? If the things that you're saying doesn't make sense, sometimes from an engineering, physics, biomechanics perspective, it probably doesn't make sense in your exercise movement perspective. Yeah. Right? Because it's all underneath the same principles, underneath the same laws that govern our world. So if you're thinking about learning, doing things like that, study things that are fundamentally true. So do you always have to update your framework? Yeah. Oh, science hasn't caught up in this field. Don't talk shit. (laughs) (laughs) It will never catch up because it doesn't, like you say, it doesn't have that crossover into other fields. And someone that can't cross over into other fields, I also feel maybe doesn't have, doesn't have their feet in the game. Is a business coach without a business. Right. I think that's a, that's a nice way to, to finish it up. Andy, you have been absolute star coming on i really appreciate you 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 know taking out time of your busy busy schedule um tell people where to go to find you um and let them know you know what you want them to find out about you and what you got going on no for sure before i sign off um i had someone at the seminar ask me hey you know what are some resources that you have to learn about plyos and i just looked at him and said matt mckinnis watson plus plyos that's it don't make things more confusing than they need to be. Matt's changed the game for me in terms of just higher level performance stuff. So like if you guys are on the fence about intro to plyos, taking a seminar, just like talking shop with the dude, this guy is world class. So highly recommend him. If you want to hang out with me, talk with me, find out a little bit more about what I do, it's at Dr. Amy Chen. Um, that'll kind of get you to everything else, physical therapy practice, educational stuff. But I'm always open to helping out any way that I can. And Matt, dude, always appreciates your support and thank you for having me on. You're too kind, Andy. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in and we will see you on the next one.